asked me to talk about uh, herd management and long-term drought. What I would rather do is uh, talk about herd management in the near term, and then I think that will apply to long-term drought also, because we could find ourselves in this position we're in right now recurring over the next few years. I hope, hope not, but, uh, but if that is a good possibility. And with continued stress on our, you know, our forage production, uh, the kind of things we're going to talk about here will apply long term as well as in the next uh, next few months. I, I don't know if you've heard Dr. Peel's presentations on the Sun Up or the radio or whatever lately, but I think we agree that the next 60 days or so, and, and it's <coughs> common sense you all would recognize that the next 60 days very critical. Commented relative to forage production, but particularly for how many cows you want and need to keep uh, through this summer and, and going forward. So, one of the things that Leland, asked, Leland McDaniel asked me to talk about last week down to this uh, Red River Roundup, or no, early spring roundup, I think, some roundup or another, south of Ardmore there was cold cows. So, let's just start with that one because I think it's pretty simple, and that is those should have been sold before today possible and probably last <coughs> last summer you know in here in Oklahoma we went from 2010 we had right at 2.1 million beef cows and we were second in the country in terms of number of beef cows by the end of 2011 we had dropped to 1.75 million beef cows somewhere <coughs> right around there the USDA kind of keeps adjusting it up and down a little bit but we went down over 12 percent there uh, in 2000 and Dr. Peel says in 2012 we only dropped slightly in numbers of beef cows. But I don't know what where we rank now in the country, but we're far from second, fourth. Okay, so so we have we've obviously dropped a lot. Other states picked up some of that, some of those cows. A lot of them have gone to slaughter because we have the lowest cow herd that we've had. Uh, I don't know what were we down to now, 1949 or something like that. And so. So we do have fewer cows, but some of them just changed addresses. In 2011, they went north, right? A lot of cows wound up in the in the Dakotas, and Montana, uh, western Nebraska. Last year, they couldn't go to north. They're in Oregon and Washington now. Are there still some some cows? They're in up Oregon north? and Washington. They went over the top of the mountain where they went out of Nebraska and Wyoming. Yeah. Dave, are you ta are you talking about statewide down? 12, 15 percent? Yes. Yep, statewide. I mean, I'm, I, I, I'd venture a guess that in this county, we're, our cow herd's down 50 percent. Way, way more than that. And that's, t yeah, that's or, or more. typical western yeah. Oklahoma. Uh, you know, I, I drove up through, uh, had, a, had a funeral in Kansas yesterday, and so drove up through southeast Kansas. And man, let me tell you, that country looks like the land of milk and honey. I mean, their wheat is beautiful. Southeast Kansas, and there's grass in the ditches, and the grass is starting to green up. It looks really pretty good over there. And you look at, I'm going to show you the, you can withstand another U.S. drought water <coughs> map here in just a minute for a different purpose, but we'll look at that, and you can see that right there where, where I drove through yesterday is not white, it's not dark red, but even even just kind of moderate drought, uh, the country looked look pretty good. Anyway, I'm getting off topic here, but. Uh, so beef cow numbers, I just talked to Peel out there in the hallway a little bit ago, and he thought his interpretation of this last USDA report was that we're down somewhere right around 1.7. So we didn't we didn't decline very much in 2012, but he's he has been saying now for several weeks and maybe a couple of months that he sees another major uh, herd liquidation coming up in the next 60 days if you know if something doesn't change. That's certainly a good possibility. Okay, so the question then is, if you haven't already sold them, what Leland McDaniel asked me to talk about the, at the uh, his program there at Ardmore was managing cold cows, and, and and there just really isn't any good answer or reason to be doing that. <laughs> I can't think of what it would be because if you, you know if you just very simple example, if you 
think about trying to put weight on a cold cow, you're talking about somewhere between eight and 10 pounds of feed, like a feedlot diet, for every pound of weight gain. Okay, that feed will probably cost you about 15 cents a pound. Okay, multiply that times 10, you got a dollar 50. Multiply times eight, you got what, a dollar 40? Is that right? So, every pound of that gain is worth what? 90 at the top. 90 at the top end, probably 75 to 90. Okay, for those cold cows, and it's and it's going to cost you a dollar thirty to dollar fifty to get there. So, you know, there, unless you've got cheap forage, which I don't know anybody that does, uh, there's there's really no good reason to hang on to cows that should have been cold. Okay, so the question is, how deep do you cut, and are you smart enough to know which ones you really should cut, uh, or, or and or do you have a plan? And we can certainly help our producers with that question and then of course when to sell more. So that kind of leads me into uh, the rest of the, my presentation here this morning. That is what I'm going to do is I'm going to challenge you with some, I think what we could be talking to our producers about relative to opportunities. And there are some opportunities out there just like most every time we have a disaster like this, you know, somebody's sitting on an opportunity. Now it won't be for everyone. But I remember shortly after I moved here, uh, we, we had no wheat pasture. It must have been like 1997 or the fall of 1998, one of those two years. Um, but we had no indication of moisture and, and no wheat pasture development, whatever year that was. But people could buy corn, wood, and feed and soybean hulls and have them delivered to their places for $70 a ton. We had a lot of people utilize that as their wheat pasture that year and made a lot of money doing it. So there are things like that I think we can be looking for. Some, some cows could possibly be relocated here, uh, out in this country right here. Anywhere probably from here north, is, if that country's in good shape, what's going to happen? They're going to plant corn, right? And if they haven't already plowed it up, they're, they're going to. But most of it's already. So there's just not a lot of grass left in this part of the world. Uh, but there have been, I've talked to several ranchers who have leased uh, ranches and even maybe buying some country over, over in this area. So a lot of cows have already changed addresses and are headed that, that way. We bought for the Department of Animal Science some hay from a gentleman in southern Louisiana this year, and they've had so much rain, you know, they don't know what to do with all the hay they've produced. He was trying to give us hay but I couldn't afford to ship it up here. You know, it, it was costing me close to 100 bucks a ton just, to, just for the freight. Uh, so there is some grass over there, but a lot of cows have already changed direction or changed their address and probably filled that up. So the, the really interesting thing and opportunity, I think, that this scenario creates, you know, obviously there aren't gonna be any cows go north. This is where Danny, I think, said cows have gone, right? And then yeah, that's what they were telling sense. me in Wyoming, northern Colorado, yeah. Nebraska. They had been, all their cattle had been going to Idaho, <coughs> a little bit to west to, to, to Wyoming, but most of them were in Washington and Oregon. Are they just leasing grass seasonally? Uh, they were the cattle we sent up to them, and they were going to all make a home run, and they grazed everything down to the dirt. And they were having to send them out as quick as they could. The only ones they had up there when I was up there were the ones that were grazing on some corn. Yeah. It was about waist high. Okay. So, so if we assume that, say, that country is pretty much full, and this country is pretty much full, the cold cow market is in good shape. We don't have any place to go north with them. What it's interesting, uh, what it's led to is a situation where the cold cow market is good, but the bread cow market is so let's just talk about some of these scenarios. Heat cows you have for another 60 to 90 days to hold for an adequate rain. Everybody's going to be doing that regardless. But sell more cows. Uh, and that means you're talking about selling some cows that are either in late gestation. You're talking about in the next 60 to 90 days making a decision to sell a bunch of those cows that you had hoped you could keep that have baby calves on them. So what are they worth? And then fall calving cows, you know, if you haven't already early weaned those calves, they're weighing probably somewhere in that 250 to 300 range. I went out and looked at our fall calving cows. Uh, so
Sunday, and we're trying trying to figure out what to do with them because they, they something needs to be done if, if things don't change. We probably need to early wing those calves, get them off the calves. But um, so proximal value, here's the our seventy five to ninety dollars. You know, if a twelve hundred pound cow and a body condition score five, it ought to be worth around thousand dollars, give or take. And that's historically that's about as good a cold cow market as we've seen. But here's the interesting part of that. This is bred cows in the latest in the last the Oklahoma City report I could find was seven months pregnant. Once they get to seven, they just kind of quit calling them because they, you know, they probably have a hard time telling how close they are to calving. So this is your late bred cows, and so that pregnancy might you might argue it's worth a hundred dollars, maybe. So so that's a pretty odd situation, and these are not just say we've culled deep enough going from 2.1 to 1.7 million cows we've culled deep enough these aren't just junk bred cows some of them are sure uh, but uh, but for the most part those are pretty decent kind of cows in the four to maybe eight years of age range and so what about uh, pears you might argue that say a cow with a 400 pound calf on them usually they don't get sold that way but might be worth 15 uh, but a lot of the pairs are selling. Daryl said this week it looked like more like 1150 to 1250. Yeah, I haven't hardly seen a pair sell. I mean, if they're if they're up and going good, they're splitting them at Woodward. Yeah, yeah, they, and that's you usually know. the case. You, you can't hardly find a yeah a big pair a cow with a big calf purchased that way. So. I mean, they're splitting bucket calves off of them because bucket yeah. calves worth three and three fifty. Yeah, and exactly. Cows and so, and so you sell that bred cow, you know, for a hundred dollar premium instead of just waiting for a few weeks for the calf. You're really giving up a considerable amount of income there, plus all your planning and you know management that went into to getting her to that to that condition to begin with. Okay, and so then those fall born calves are probably worth a, somewhere in the neighborhood of six hundred dollars. The steers certainly are, and so. You know, it wouldn't take too long to get those new baby calves uh, to that 300 pounds. And so we, you know, the, the idea is, what could you do, or what can your producers do to maybe retain ownership of those little calves and make them worth 600 dollars instead of selling them for 100 dollars uh, as a bred cow? Because there's, because a, there's, Eric said a little bit ago, there's strong demand for that beef and the cows. As far as the bread cow goes, there's really no place left for them to go. And so there's a lot of pressure on the market for bread cows and for brand new cow calf pairs. <coughs> okay, so let's just go through an, a, an example. I'm going to talk for the next few minutes about early weaning and how people might be able to use that in the next few weeks. And if this recurs again in the future, you know, it's a tool that they ought to at least consider having ready to go in their, in their toolbox. And I'll tell you right now, it's not going to be for everybody because early weaning in a 45 to 60 day old baby calf is, is pretty scary if you've never done it before. Uh, but let's just go through a quick example here. And uh, Justin said he's grazing the cow to 50 acres. <laughs> so my example is not very applicable here. But around the Stillwater area, I think, long term being 20 years around eight acres is probably what most of those people are doing they ought to be probably animal unit for 10 and so that's where i started with this example animal unit for 10 acres so first of all what's an animal unit thousand pound cow with a calf okay, so thousand, no, it, it's there's no existence of a thousand pound cow out yeah, there anymore exactly. so it's it's 1.3 animal units <laughs> to 15 yeah. acres yeah so, so it's a, so Danny's right. It's a thousand pound cow, but whether or not she has a calf, okay. When they calculate animal use, they don't care whether she has a calf or not. Now, I think that the assumption is that she's going to calve in the spring, and that calf's going to weigh 500 pounds in the fall. But the other assumption is that she consumes how much forage? Remember, 24 pounds. 26. 26. Okay, so. So that's one animal unit for 10 acres. It doesn't work very well with, with early weaning, so I kind of kicked animal units out after this point, but I just wanted to remind you uh, 
what that was. So we got a thousand acre pasture. Normally, it's twelve hundred pound cows. Danny, he doesn't put a hundred of those twelve hundred pound cows out there. He puts eighty three of them out there, and that calculates to one animal unit per <coughs> ten acres. Okay, his goal is to get through the year with feeding very little hay, only in really severe winter uh, weather conditions. So ice. doesn't do anything uh, like a lot of my neighbors do or apparently are planning to do he's going to have an average grazing pressure of 132,000 pounds of, of cattle okay let me tell you how I calculated that real quick I tried to be as fair as I could throughout animal units because I knew that those baby calves really don't provide any grazing pressure until they turn into a true ruminant and that happens somewhere between 250 to 300 pounds so I just said, okay, let's start at 250 and take them to weaning, and we're going to count their weight then as grazing pressure. And so that's their average weight during, you know, the latter half of the, of the summer there when they'd be big enough to utilize a significant amount of forage. So 132,000 pounds in that thousand uh, acre pasture. So if we're going to assume that he decides, where's Dr. Redford? Right here. Is 50% is that enough on that native pasture? I've got that in some of my examples. <laughs> okay. All right. So we're going to we're going to use it. We're going to say he determines now that he needs to cut it 50%. In 60 days, he'll know how much he should have cut it or still needs to cut it, right? But but I'm saying uh, we're going to start having to start making some of these decisions right away. So one thing he could do, and this is uh, example A, compared to doing nothing, is sell 42 cows and either bred cows and or calves, baby calves, okay? So you're just going to game cut 42 head and send them to the livestock market. So what does that do? Uh, it gives him 41 calves to market next fall, and it cuts his grazing pressure down to 66,000 pounds of cattle. So obviously he just cut it. Problem is, in years going forward, of course, uh, you only have half the cows and you only have half the calves to add value to. And you sold all those bred cows and new pairs in a depressed market because there's really no good place to go with them except for the, the slaughter uh, or harvest. Sorry, great market. Okay, so stocking decisions. Uh, let's talk a little bit then about early weaning and see where we could that. Uh, so let's say, well, you're probably, you're probably well aware of this, this kind of just generally describes early weaning, 45 to 60 days of age, uh, could sell the cows immediately, grow calves using high concentrate diet and dry lot, and the nice thing is it requires no hay, at least for those calves. Um, what's, the, what's the other advantage if you do keep the cows? Basically, if you just go ahead and wean the calves, put them in dry lot, get them off the pasture, or you, or you don't plan to turn them out, you cut, you, I mean, you stop milk production, right? And so that reduces your stocking rate and their nutrient requirement by somewhere in the neighborhood of 20%. Just by, just by taking the calves off the calves. And now, you know, of course, everybody's question is going to be, well, what am I going to do with all those? all those calves, can I add value to them economically, and am I prepared to do that from a <coughs> labor management skill standpoint? But that's, that's how early weaning works, um, and it's, it works because, well, number one, you can put them in a dry lot, feed a concentrate diet because those little calves, you can't just turn them out on the pasture, or they, they'll end up looking like a, a bottle calf, you know, with a big pot belly, and they just don't perform very well. Without mother's milk, you've got to replace it with high concentrate, high protein diet. Um, 
and the cost in that case should be should not be the primary consideration. And we, you know, we've been showing this stuff for years. When on occasion when early weaning made sense, and so this isn't anything new. This is the recipe or Dr. Gill's ration from years ago. His early weaning ration, very simple, high protein. That's around 18 percent, just under 18 percent protein diet. High in energy with a little bit of fiber. Extremely powerful. Now, I called uh, one of our feed commodity groups and I said, Come up with some alternatives for this, and I need a price delivered within 60 miles of your places. And the place I called was Livestock Nutrition Center because uh, a lot of you would have access to their commodities, their feed blends. And Ronnie's come back with, he said, You could, we can deliver this within 60 miles of, I guess for you all, would be Altus or Chickasha. Guthrie uh, for somewhere between $290 up to $320 for his most expensive time. So about 15 cents a pound. And, and it didn't have the alfalfa pellets. He's re he'd replaced that with soybean hulls and a little bit of uh, distiller's dried grains and some other things. But still really nice concentrate diet and high, high uh, energy and high protein. Okay, so this is some of Dr. Gill and Lesby's uh, experiments. <coughs> Actually, Dr. I think Heavy Purvis uh, did did this work when he was here. Uh, but these three studies averaged 36 days. The calves weighed a little over 200 pounds. They ate a little less than eight pounds of feed. Um, average daily gain was a little over two pounds a day, and the feed gain was 3.6 to one. Okay, so if you multiply uh, 15 cents. 3.6, you come up with a feed cost of gain of about what? It's, it's a little over 50. Uh, it, I mean, depending if we use his $290 versus $320, you're going to get a feed cost of gain of somewhere between uh, 54 cents and 60 cents. Okay, each pound of that gain is worth. Market price on those calves at 300 pounds or 350 is going to be pretty close to two bucks. Sure. Uh, but the value of the gain is what is it, Greg? Dollar twenty? Yeah, but probably about a dollar twenty, give or take a dime. <coughs> so, so if you if you take out the market slide for the calves getting bigger, it's about a buck twenty. Okay, and it's costing 55 to 60 cents. So, you know those those little calves are very efficient. And, they, and if you keep them on the ranch of origin and just expose them to the same bugs they've been exposed to since they're, they were born, they still have maternal antibodies. They stay healthy a lot better than most people suspect. It's not nearly as scary as, as people think it would be. Um, so death of be still the three to five percent? No, no, I wouldn't expect it to be over one. I, I, anybody else had any recent experience with early weaning? So, um, so, so let's just use option B then as our first early weaning example. We're going to say we're going to wean all the calves, kind of go radical here, wean all the calves and sell all the cows, okay, on April 15th. That assumes that they're calving now by April 15th, they're at least 45 days of age. Uh, that means you could, if you put them on a 45 day growing program with this early weaning diet, you turn those little calves out when about 275 on June 15th. So sold half the cows, right? Nope, all the cows, sold all the cows. And now we're just gonna turn all the calves out so we've delayed our turnout, Dr. Redford. Quite a while. You like that? I like that. We got rid of all the cows. We did good. We did good so far. So far. And our grazing pressure at the end of the summer, or end of the actually this is all the way through the year, is 35,000 pounds compared to 130 
two or three thousand pounds. Okay, so, and, and then we have all the calves to do whatever we want to with at that time. And they should weigh somewhere between, you know, 550 and 575. So you have to treat them, once you turn them out, once they turn into true ruminants and you turn them out on June 15th, on say that native pasture, we still don't think it's a very good idea to just ignore them and treat them like yearlings. You still need to provide a gold or super gold type program, which is just a one pound to two and a half pounds of supplement to keep those calves gaining efficiently. They just need a little bit of help at that young age. And, and we all know how efficient the gold and super gold program is uh, from, from an additional cost of weight gain standpoint. It's very cost effective. And so, recommend that you go ahead and implement that program too on these little calves. Uh, so we've accomplished cutting way back on our grazing pressure because the cows are gone. We have delayed turnout and then when we do turn out we turn it out very little weight really and we still have a source of income in October. We've taken a hundred dollar premium maybe for a bred cow and we've turned it into a probably a, whatever a 550 pound Cash is going to be worth next fall, but it's going to be quite bad. More than $100. And it's going to be closer to $800 or maybe $900. Okay? And so I'm pretty sure we can pay for, for that feed, the early weaning program and the, and the summer supplement with six, seven hundred dollars $700 of increased gross income. All right. Um, Option C here, just, you know, you could do this with any number of cows. You could go as deep as, you're, as you are brave. If you want to think of it that way, you could early wean your early born calves and sell those cows, but it's probably a bad idea because you're selling your cows that are most effectively efficient or aggressive or whatever. Uh, but you could, you could do it with your late born cows, and that, and that would represent the cows that you probably do want to sell uh, if you have to fall deeper. You could early wean your steer calves and turn them out later in the summer and then when it comes around to marketing time in fall you already have value added program right you've already got those calves weaned already taken care of you just have to follow up with the vaccinations to uh, qualify for GANS Oklahoma Quality Beef Network program or one of the commercial programs uh, and, and certainly, <coughs> certainly the heifers would qualify as well or go into some sort of a heifer development program or just whatever. Uh, but, but here I just said, well, let's just sell half the cows, and early wean half the calves. Uh, turn out June 15th, same kind of deal. We reduce the grazing pressure in that scenario by 45%. Uh, that's 45% overselling. I'm about, you know, it's just actually, it's pretty much the same, almost the same reduction in grazing pressure if we just sold half the cows in a with a pregnancy or a baby calf inside. Okay, so the point is early weaning half of those uh, th those calves and you turn them out later in the summer just represent very little grazing pressure. That's really the bottom line. Okay, so another thing I, I think we probably need to be <coughs> encouraging people to think about is um, this concept of limit feeding. And there may be times in long-term drought here where this makes sense, and maybe times where it just won't pencil because grain is so expensive. Uh, but right now, I'm going to show you an example here in a minute, but uh, to limit <coughs> a cow is a little bit cheaper than just having to go out on the market and buy grain and supplement. It's not a lot cheaper, but it's a little bit cheaper. There's a fact, we have a fact sheet on limit feeding concentrates uh, to cows, and so you know, that's available to you. Uh, but to get the pressure off the pastures, this is something we need to be encouraging people to think about. Probably some of our receiving yards, maybe, guys with uh, good facilities and mixing wagons and so on, ought to be thinking about uh, turning into a, a cow hotel. Sure, that's already the market is already kind of driving things that way. I don't know if you've heard of Dr. Kenneth Ng, longtime feedlot consultant, writes now for 
Beef Magazine occasionally and wrote for years for Feedstuffs. But he has made himself wealthy doing this. He goes to, basically goes to an area of the country that's in the middle of a drought, buys up a bunch of good quality, really cheap cows at the express market, finds somebody in the area that has skills, knowledge, and a mixer and feed bunks and a little kind of a feedlot situation. And he comes up with a, a grain diet Feeds those, limit feeds those cows a lot cheaper than you can go out and buy harvest to forage in that uh, stress market. And then eventually, he moves the cows to wherever there's grass. And it might be Montana or Idaho, it might be South Dakota, it might be back in Oklahoma. So he's used this concept for years uh, to make a lot of money. Uh, value, uh, let's see, viable option to feed costs, and certainly a you can do it with very little forage. And the better manager you are, the better nutrition person you are, the less forage you can get by with. Our rule of thumb is about half a percent of body weight of hay, of long stem hay. But that's pretty safe. <coughs> you can push that number lower. So six pounds of hay on a 1,200 pound cow. Uh, if you know what you're doing, if you're consistent and a good manager. Here's an example, 10 pounds of a concentrate feed. Uh, Ronnie Castleberry gave me a price of about 15 cents a pound on a, on a feed that would meet these specs. Uh, 14 cents, I guess, times 10 pounds is $1.40 a day. Six pounds of hay, say you're giving $150 a ton of trips, 45 cents. So that's a cost today of $1.85 currently. And so you multiply 25 or 26 pounds of hay times seven and a half cents a pound, then you add Two pounds of a 40% supplement's going to cost what? Three fifty. Who's priced forties lately? So twenty, you know, twenty cents pound. That's forty cents for the supplement, we'll say, uh, and the cost of the hay, and, and you've got a, a little bit of a savings represented there. Any questions about that? So no, I, I, we didn't get it, we're not going to get in have time to get into much of the science here and review the literature and all that but, but the concept is what's important and you know we have a fact sheet for it uh, same with early weaning those are ideas of people how long eat. can you keep them cows in that scenario I, I think if, if you manage them well um, and you don't you know are you concerned about like acidosis. Yeah, I'm kind of just thing. wondering how, you know, can you keep them there a year? Can you keep, is this a... Yeah. Yep, it, you know, if you don't uh, push the limit on, you know, low room and pH foundry room, you have good management. Yeah, you can. This is an option they're going to be looking at in the fall of this year for those who sold their cows three years ago and the government says you're going to pay taxes on those cows that you mm -hmm. sold so they could come back, buy some cows in the fall, put them in a concentration diet like that till at least after the first of the year, and then extend that extend that period of time to 40%. Because the, the number one key y'all keep forgetting up there is if we sell these cows, and we have sold these cows, yeah. now we're looking at giving the government their half of the cow herd. Is, is the, are those uh, drought or disaster tax rules going to be extended? Do yeah. You have any idea? Pretty right. sure they have been. Okay. I think you can roll them another three years past this fall. Past this fall. Okay. Well, that's, that, what yeah, I that's I true. I, I hadn't heard that. But that's kind of what I understood. Jody will talk about that, that second one. I, think that's I, I, don't know if, I don't know if Jody's going to talk about that. We, that'd be a better question for, for J.C. Hobbs. Okay. And, I mean, I can call him and get that from him. Okay. All right. I was under the impression I, was going to be. I can't I just I can't imagine they wouldn't extend it, but and they usually do. Yeah. So any any other questions about limit feeding uh, cows in particular? Or early weaning. Okay, so this is just my little song and dance that I've been given. We we've done some research on improving forage utilization, particularly harvested forage utilization. And I'm, I'm just going to remind you about that here. 
we can cut back on hay use by somewhere between 10 and 30 percent, uh, and we can do it easily. I told you I drove to southeast Kansas yesterday, and farm after farm after farm after farm, we see a round bell feeder with hay just spewing out of it, and cattle tromping, crapping, laying on. It's just incredible. It's just incredible that we keep doing that in, in the cow business with $150 ton hay and seven, eight, you know, seven dollar bushel corn. It just blows my mind that we're, you know, we have we've gotten used to that culture, the two dollar corn culture, basically, and we just kind of keep keep on keeping on. Gradually, that will probably have to work itself out. But uh, limit feeding hay, limiting access to hay, you should be able to cut back somewhere between 50 and 20 percent on hay use. To be a little bit careful with old cows and heifers, uh, but it's a strategy that more people ought to be doing. You can do it with the, your bale unroller, uh, determine ahead of time how much those cows need and only give them that much and cut way back on waste when you control the amount that they receive. I for the literature says you should be able to cut back about 10% when you use remensin, which is the only uh, cleared ion for for beef cows. Got a little, just a little bit of data that says that it's at least that good. We're going to do another experiment this winter uh, to try to see if we can follow up on that and get uh, good results the second time. And then you've all seen the hay feeder type research. Uh, the open bottom feeders are wasting somewhere between 20 and 21 percent of the hay, which you've heard me say it probably, but I just, it, it's just, we just can't afford to keep doing that. Spend so much money on that hay crop and so much effort, and then take it out to feed the cows, and at that point, just blow another 20% of it. Now, you could argue that, yeah, there's fertilizer and there's organic material, but it's all piled up right there, you know, and so I don't think we're getting very much use out of what's getting wasted around that feed. And so the sheeted bottom cuts that down to about 13% cone plus sheeted bottom and almost any kind of cone mechanism you can come up with, I'm convinced, with the sheeted bottom will cut it down to five. Okay, so there's eight percent between each one of those. And so if you can just get your people to thinking about put it put some chicken wire around the bottom of your feeder, dang it, <laughs> you can really save them a lot of money. Just just a, just uh, we've had I've had guys come up to me in meetings and say we started after seeing that we started uh, taking the plastic bottoms out of bunks, you know the cheap pea bunks, and wrap them around and pop ribbon them to our feeders, and they're not too heavy, they don't dent like a sheet of tin would, and I said well good for you because that's probably gonna that's probably gonna save you about eight percent of your hay crop to cut back on the amount of hay you need next year by about eight percent. Uh, and then ammoniation, I, you know, this one, technology's been around forever. It's one we kind of keep forgetting about. Um, if you're in an area that has access to anhydrous ammonia, we calculated last year that anhydrous alone was worth about $40 on the supplement bill. I mean, it saved about $40 per cow on the supplement bill if you didn't restrict access to the hay. Uh, it increases the energy value of the hay enough that you should be able to cut back another 10 or even 15 percent uh, on the amount of hay that you have to feed. Okay, so uh, that that's another, even though anhydrous is expensive, we, <coughs> grad student Dylan made up a little Excel spreadsheet that you're all certainly welcome to where you can real quickly calculate what it's going to cost you to moniate the hay this year, next year, I guess. But right now it's costing somewhere between 25 and 35 dollars a ton to do it. Still, it winds up saving you a lot, a lot of money uh, compared to feeding uh, standard low-quality hay and making the difference up with really, really expensive supplement. How long will that work on a, on a bale of hay? Are you talking about doing that two weeks before feeding, or doing it in the middle of the summer and it'll maintain till November, December before the money? Yeah, I, I think generally the fact sheet says around a month. And the hotter it is, the shorter. Two weeks is probably plenty when it's hot. Um, six weeks is probably better when it's getting down to 25 degrees at night and up to 40, 45 in the daytime. Something to do in November, December. Then. Well, I mean, we, yeah, I, 
I'd like to see people do it soon after the hay is harvested as possible because then you don't get rain. <coughs> you get rain on the hay, you're going to wind up with some wet spots in it, and the anhydrous concentrates in those wet spots. So it's better if you can go ahead. And then you're not sitting around waiting for it to dry out after a after rain. Kind of need to have a day that's not terribly windy, so I just soon go ahead and get it done, just as soon as we can get it stacked. Uh, but Greg's had some people do it this year. Anybody else had some people? Uh, Tommy, yeah, that's what we're talking about. But I got to wait until December. Tried to uncover it after three weeks, and it was too early. It, it was still very heavy ammonia under there. So he, uh, I, I think he needed. Well, I mean, basically, if you're, you're wheat, I mean, wheat straw and stuff like that, you do that in July and put it on there. You're talking about feed it, feed it before August is what you're saying. Oh no, I no, no I, I was saying leave it under, leave it sealed for okay. thirty days. Okay, two weeks to six weeks. But it'll order. maintain the quality after that time period for oh, yeah. a period of time. Yeah. I mean, I always tell people, man, you pay for the plastic. Don't take it off. <laughs> yeah. Let it shed the water for as long as you can. Yeah, <coughs> there's there's no downside to leaving it covered. Okay, so just a quick example. Uh, I'm, I, how am I doing for time, Eric? We need to. Uh, you got to have a ten fifteen. Five. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> We decided to go ahead and we didn't have the resources to look at each one of these technologies independently on the previous slide. So we just did one this year with everything but ammoniation. I got a little bit of preliminary results on it. Okay, so he, he's, he's got a control of 24 7 access to hay, uh, typical hay feeder, which is yellow ring, and that's actually not true because I've discovered finally that most people don't have those good feeders. Them, but by far and away, the most popular feeder is the Ag Shop feeder with, uh, with no, no sheeted bottom and with no feed additive. So, uh, so the technology group is all three of those seven hours access to hay. So, he just got cattle panels around the, the big concrete pads, and after seven hours, he pushed the cows out and shut the gate. Modified cone, we use the Vexor in this one again, and then 200 milligrams. Per day in the supplement. Okay. This is a picture of the standard, and I think we're going to have higher than 13% hay waste with this good yellow feeder. That's a really nice feeder. It's very, uh, very much a commercial feeder, heavy metal <coughs> kind of heavy feeders. But we're going to have more hay waste this year because our hay is just so dry, and the stem length or particle length is pretty short because of the drought. Line. So when we take the strings or net wrap off these bales, they just they just fall apart. And you can see that here. This is standard management, and he took that picture right before Christmas. And there's the technology group. Those pictures were both taken 24 hours after that bale was put in the feeder, before the concrete pad was cleaned again. Okay, so we'll just take a minute. So we've got three things working for us here. You can see his cattle panels around that. What's the cost difference between that feeder? There's not that much material added. Uh, it is quite a bit more expensive, Danny. This one's 500. <coughs> Last time I checked, it was about like five and a quarter of still water milling there, still water. And this one was going to be around, probably around 300, three, three and a quarter, I think. <coughs> but but yeah. it's just incredible. You just walk out there, and, and all you got to do is, you know, you've got two pin reps of this one and two pin reps of the other one, and it's just like, you know, what have we been doing all these years? The <laughs> difference being, the difference being is you got to have a tractor to put the bale in that one. Now, you we can gather. we can sort of get a bale in there with our dewies, and it's actually not a dewies, but a hydraulic arms on the back of the truck. A, a uh, you to be pretty good with it. A spike bed you can't. No. no. And these are. These are big five to six bales. These are weighing 1,400 to 1,440 pounds. A smaller bale, you might be able to kind of get up in there. Yep, that, so definitely that's a limitation. You can't hardly, unless you've got some help with you, you could put, you could 
pick that up, roll it to a bell, and drop it on. But what you'll find out is your hay feeder is stuck up in the air. Yeah. It won't work. So, uh, so yeah, definitely that's a, that would be a challenge or limitation for some. Okay, so here's the here's the interesting part of that is uh, weight change after 84 days on those two treatments is basically nothing. No difference in weight change. Uh, difference in hay fed, which, well, I can't, I, don't, I guess I don't have a calculator, but it represents an 18% reduction in the amount of hay okay, for the technology group of cows. He's got, right now, we're just starting weight cows on Monday, a uh, study where he's going to use ammoniation on top of those other three technologies should allow us to restrict access to the hay down to about five hours. Okay, and I, I, you know, I'm looking forward to seeing how that works, but we do the exact same, uh, I don't know, set up there with the restricted access, better hay feeder, minor pork, and ammoniation compared to hay harvest the same day in the same meadow without it. Unrolling it better or worse? I, you know, I don't know. That that's a good question. It comes up every time I give the hay saving hay or improving hay efficiency. That's the first thing that somebody pops up and says, "What about unrolling it?" And all I can say is, there's been a there's been two or three little projects done on that. Uh, it's very difficult to measure because you know when you unroll it out in the pasture and you try to go measure the waste, you're scraping up grass, dry grass that's already out there, maybe some on you know we don't have concrete pads that we use here but I think I think the practical answer to that is it depends on how much you <coughs> so if you restrict their access you don't feed them all they would eat and you leave them a little bit hungry they don't waste much but if you if you try to use an interval feeding scenario and try to feed enough hay to last them every two you know two or three days they waste a lot About a good answer. Okay, I'm not going to bore you with any hydrous ammoniation stuff. You guys have, you guys have uh, seen that, have a fact sheet on it, and so on. So, okay, early weaning could provide a lot of flexibility for some people. Um, I'm going to leave it up to Roger and Dr. Gavis to calculate the economics on it, when, uh, when and how deep we should early wean and that kind of thing. Uh, but it's definitely something I think we need to be thinking about. <coughs> Especially when we have a depressed market uh, for those bred cows and pairs. Take advantage of low hanging fruit, and I and I I think we might ought to package, might ought to consider packaging the hay feeding or the hay feeder thing like they did the Oklahoma Gold deal years ago. To try to make a big push on that. I, I don't know. I'd like to hear your feedback if you think it's worthwhile. Uh, but it's definitely low hanging fruit. When I ask. When I ask, uh, before I give the improving forage utilization talk, I ask people, how many of you have a hay feeder? Guess what happens? <laughs> everybody raises their hand. Everybody. Okay, and so it touches everybody that we deal with. Uh, but that, the restricted access, the honor for, not everybody's going to be able to do all three, but most everybody can do at least one of them. Limit feeding cows would be a, a very effective strategy at times during drought periods. Again, that's not going to be for everybody, but there's some folks uh, who could probably you know, make a lot of money or hang on to some cows and have a, a very valuable commodity when we come out of that deal. Questions? in, in 
this discussion as well. It's just a really big topic <laughs> we don't have time to dive into today. But the theory of a 1,400-pound cow per calf as relative to a 1,000-pound cow or 1,200, whatever you say, she's not going to make that much more money than 1,400 over 12, right? Well, I don't think so. And the data <coughs> we have, and I know you all have seen it several times, but we, we did three different operations. And granted, they're, they're research herds. All three of them are research herds, but they're managed like a commercial cow calf herd. In other words, not, not <coughs> babied, just fed a little bit of supplement. And the answer in all three of those herds, pretty much the same answer was that for every additional 100 pounds of cow, mature cow body weight, you got an additional six pounds of calf weaning weight. Demona says it takes 40 bucks to keep the extra 100 pounds of cow weight a year. And the six pounds of additional, of additional calf weight is worth what? Eight, nine dollars. So you're right. I, you know, I can't, I can't figure out how we can make it work here in Oklahoma. So, so Dave, what do you think? Well, I, I think certainly it's going to go down. Now, I don't, I don't think it needs to or should go down in the, the thousand pound range. I don't, I don't think it'll get that extreme. But, uh, but it's going to moderate. I mean, the, the economic environment that we're in is going to force us to. We, like, I, like I've said, we, we have gotten used to the $2 corn culture. And that has left us, you know, we've just kept pushing the envelope as far as all those traits go. Well, it falls 